This morning we're going to begin a study, uh, a series of studies on the, on the prophet Elijah. Uh, Elijah is a, probably one of the most profound of the prophets, as we're going to see as we get into him, uh, as we study about what he had to do. This will probably be a rather long series. Uh, I don't anticipate it wrapping up quickly. We're looking at I don't know, a month, month and a half, something like that. But there's wonderful teaching in every verse within this. It only occupies a few chapters of the Bible, but those few chapters of the Bible, what's there is um, it's really a great story. Um, thank you, Zach. The, um, there have been many people that have written about Elijah, and one of, them, one of them is one of my favorite writers. He's got a lot of really good things to say, and then he's got some, like everybody, everybody's got chicken, and everybody's got bones, and you have to be able to eat the chicken and throw away the bones. Um, he, he's very good on Elijah. His name is A.W. Pink. He was a Baptist preacher. I think he died the year I was born, in 1952. I don't remember how old of a man he was. He was a, a British uh, preacher primarily. Um, and uh, and had some really good things to say. He was one that, as he as he progressed, he got better. The older pink writings that you find are better than the earlier ones. Where uh, Charles Spurgeon kind of went the other way. The early Spurgeon is better than the later. He kind of drifted in the other direction. So. Um, but, but Pink is very good. And Pink wrote in, in his introduction to, to his book on Elijah, Elijah appeared on the stage of public action during one of the darkest hours of Israel's sad history. He is introduced to us at the beginning of 1 Kings 17, and we have but to read through the previous chapters to discover what a deplorable state God's people were then in. Israel had grievously and flagrantly, flagrantly departed from Jehovah, and that which directly opposed him had been publicly set up. Never before had the favored nation sunk so low. Fifty-eight years had passed since the kingdom had been written twain following the death of Solomon. During that brief period, no less than seven kings had reigned over the ten tribes, and all of them, without exception, were wicked men. Painful indeed is it to track their sad course, and still more tragic to behold how there has been a repetition of the same in the history of Christendom. Now, A.W. Pink wrote this shortly before he died. He died in 1952. He already saw that Christendom had been going the way of Elijah. That was, he died 61, almost 62 years ago. You have any idea how much farther we've gone? We certainly haven't turned around and gone back. We've continued to, continued to walk away from the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. In previous studies, um, we've talked about Solomon. And we've talked about how the, the nation of Israel at one time was one nation. It, it consisted of 12 tribes. Actually, there was one tribe that was split, and but let's not get into that. For the sake of discussion, we'll just say there were 12 tribes in the, in the, in the nation of Israel. And it, and it, com, it contained the whole, the whole of that country, um, which is really a very small country over in the Middle East. The... Um, David, King David, 
wanted more than anything in his life to build a temple for God. Uh, they, had the, they were still under the tabernacle service when David was the king, and he wanted to build the temple. In fact, and he amassed all of the material necessary in order to do that. That was his dream. That was something that he wanted to do. But because of the horrible sin that he got involved in with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband to try to cover that sin up, God wouldn't let him build the temple. He allowed David's son, Solomon, to build the temple. And when Solomon had finished the temple, God told him, as long as you're faithful to me, then I'll, I will take care of, of, of this nation of Israel. But if you ever drift into apostasy, then I'm gonna, that's going to end, that's going to finish off the deal with Israel. That's, that'll be the end of it. And the first thing that he, that he decided to do, because we know that Solomon drifted into apostasy, the first thing that he did was split the nation of Israel into two, into two chunks. You then ended up with the northern half of the nation of Israel, which went by the name of Israel and contained the ten tribes. Of, that were of the northern half. You then had, it wasn't really half, it was more than like two-thirds. You then had the southern portion of the kingdom, which was known as Judah, and, and contained Jerusalem. There were two tribes there, the other ten in the north. Okay? The first king to sit on the nation of Israel as a divided kingdom, once it had been divided, the first king to sit there was a man by the name of Jeroboam. And we're going to look at Jeroboam and then run through these seven kings that Pink was referring to quickly. We're not going to take a lot of time on that. Because, but you need to see that in order to understand what it was that Elijah was dealing with when he came on the scene. So that you can see where they had gone, how far they had slid. Okay, So the first king we're going to look at, we find him in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 28 through 33. And this is Jeroboam. Now there's more written about Jeroboam than many of the others. The others will only take a couple of minutes to get through. Jeroboam will take a little longer than that. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, we read, Whereupon the king took counsel, I'm not sure who he took counsel with, but he took counsel and made two calves of gold. Anybody think that's a good idea? I mean, if you think back to what Aaron did when Moses was on the mount for 40 days and the children of Israel were complaining because they thought maybe Moses was dead and Aaron came up with the idea of making a calf and declaring that this is your God and they started bowing down to it, that didn't work out so well for the nation of Israel. Well, Jeroboam made two of them. Um, probably because Jeroboam had spent some time in Egypt and in Egypt they had two calves they had one at either end of the kingdom that were there to represent their their uh, their gods so Jeroboam was taking from another nation using that to try to worship the God of heaven now one th let me make this point quickly as we go through this Jeroboam didn't he never broke the first commandment thou shalt have no other gods before me but he broke the second. Okay? He tried to, in, tried to say that these calves represented the God of heaven, just like Aaron did. Aaron said that that calf represented the God that brought him out of Egypt, that it represented Jehovah God. They were bowing to an idol that they thought represented the God of heaven. Okay? So it wasn't that they were trying to worship another god. They were trying to worship God, but worshiping him in a wrong manner. And that's the same thing that Jeroboam is doing. He's setting up these calves, saying that these idols are the thing, these represent the God of heaven that brought you out of Egypt. That's important to understand. Okay? So it wasn't the first commandment he was breaking, it was the second that you don't bow down to idols, as we'll see in a few minutes. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You see, he's referring to the God that brought him out of Egypt. Well, that would be Jehovah. Now, 
I want you to note that there is some direct disobedience here in fashion in these these graven images, if you will, and we'll actually read the commandment here in just a few minutes. Uh, verse 29, and he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan, and this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even in unto Dan. Now, remember his point, his idea was, I'm going to put these here so you don't have to travel all the way to Jerusalem. God had made a commandment that the children of Israel, and it didn't matter after he split the kingdom, he, never, he didn't change the rules. You were still, the men were supposed to present themselves in Jerusalem at the temple, which is the only place where you were to worship God and make sacrifices four times a year. You were supposed to present yourself there then in Jerusalem. He never changed that rule. Even though he split the kingdom, the rules didn't change. You were still supposed to go to Jerusalem. Well, Jeroboam felt that, well, that's too far for you to have to go. You shouldn't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. We'll set, we'll set these up, one in Bethel, one in Dan. Now, Bethel is about seven miles north of Jerusalem. That's not that far. You can walk that in a couple hours. That's not a horrendous, I, I don't know, how far is it around Lake Hollingsworth? Three miles? So, what, well, you run around Lake Hollingsworth three times and you've gone farther than you would have gone if you had to go from Bethel. To, it's not that far. Even if you have to walk, it's not a horrendous journey. Dan was a little over a hundred miles away from, um, from Jerusalem. So figure that's about as far away as Daytona Beach is from here. That's a pretty good hike. You could do it. It might take you a couple of days. If you walk four miles an hour, what's a mile every 15 minutes or something like that, it'd take you 20, five, 26 hours to walk. So it might take you a couple of days to do it. But you could do it. But it's, it's a lot farther than the seven miles, right? And yet the people started going to Dan. So it was too far for them to go to Jerusalem, which is seven miles away from the southern border. But they can go a hundred miles, that's okay. They don't have a problem doing that. They probably could have gone to Jerusalem had it not been for Jeroboam giving them an opportunity not to worship the God of heaven. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? That's why it became a sin for them. Um, well, that's one reason it became a sin. And the thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of evil, or of, of the sons of Levi, not evil. Mis I got dyslexic there for a minute, you know. The letters are all in there. It's just, uh, just kind of mixed up the way they, the way they, so at least I caught myself on that one. Um, High places. When you see the term high places used, in, especially in the Old Testament, it's not always referring to tops of mountains. Sometimes it is, but the word high there is used in the same sense that it's used over in, in the Gospels in John, where John refers to the Sabbath, that they had to get Jesus down off the cross as a high day, for that Sabbath was a high day. It's a high holy day. That's what the high places were. They were what they would consider sacred places. And in every case in the Old Testament where you see it referring to high places, those sacred places are not God's places. You don't worship God in those places. You worship God in Jerusalem. God was only to be worshipped. Sacrifices were only to be given at the place that God said he wanted them at. And at this time in history, that was in Jerusalem. Now earlier, it was what, during Abraham's time, he would build altars in different places, and that was okay. But once the tabernacle was set up, you were only to do that at the tabernacle. And once the temple was built, you were only to do it at the temple. And that law has never been changed. Which is one of the reasons today that even devout Jews to this day do not offer sacrifices. Because there's no temple. And if there were a temple, then they would start offering sacrifices again. Okay? Which is one of the reasons that we don't have a temple. Those sacrifices don't do anything now. They were just a picture to lead us to Christ. Now that he's here, there's no reason to have them anymore. Um, so he made a, a, a house of high places, and he made priests of the lowest 
of the people which were not the sons of Levi. Remember that God had determined that the tribe of Levi was the tribe that would be separated to be God's priests. In fact, they didn't even have an inheritance in the land. When they, under Joshua, when they divided the land up into different areas, the Levites didn't have, they didn't get a chunk of land. They were set aside some land amongst the other tribes and they were given the tithes from those tribes in order to live because God has always determined that his ministers should live of, of teaching about God. Uh, Paul said that, that, that they that, that uh, preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That's always been God's plan and idea. He did the same thing with the tribe of, of Levi. He would set them apart. They didn't have an inheritance. They, they were paid by the other people to be servants of God. Jeroboam decided, well, we don't need to do that. We'll just grab anybody off the street and make him a priest. Okay? So, he's building heathen places of worship. He's ordaining priests that were never intended to be priests. And what follows is widespread apostasy. It doesn't take much to realize that the man or the, 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 the man that is ordained by a man is going to follow a man. The man that's set apart by humans is going to follow humans. The man that works for God does what God tells him to do. The man that works for man does what man tells him to do. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon means that which one, where someone puts their trust. The thing that people put their trust in, that's mammon. Do you put your trust in God or do you put your trust in some denominational hierarchy that writes you a paycheck at the end of the day? If you've got a preacher that puts his trust in that denominational hierarchy, he's putting his trust in mammon. He's not putting his trust in God. Jeroboam would hire these priests and pay them accordingly. Okay. Um, verse 32, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, which you're not supposed to do. You're only supposed to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. The Feast of Tabernacles was on the fifteenth day of the seventh month. So Jeroboam ordains a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, a month later, adding to what God had said. And remember, God said over and over in the Old Testament, don't add to, don't take away from. You do what I tell you to do, you don't add to it or take away from it. Jeroboam just kept adding and adding and adding and taking away in vi direct violation of what God had told him. Verse 33, so he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. See, that wasn't a commandment of God. He came up with this one on his own. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now, I made mention of the fact of the, that he hadn't really violated the first commandment by building the calves, but he had violated the second. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5, we have these commandments, um, the first two. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Notice that Jeroboam was trying to convince the people that the god that they were worshiping was the one that brought them out of Egypt. So his intent was, you're, you're worshiping the God of Egypt, or that brought us out of Egypt, but we're worshiping by using these calves, by using these idols. But when you bow down to that idol, you're really bowing down to Jehovah God. That was what Jeroboam was trying to teach, okay? Because it's, the, it's not the idol that you're bowing to, but what the idol represents. 
That was his doctrinal position. That is a very common doctrinal position. We find it everywhere. In fact, um, let me continue to read this and then I'll, 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 I'll tie something together. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's the one that he broke. Because that would include golden calves, would it not? Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. That would include statues of Mary and Joseph and the Christ child, would it not? If you make those, aren't you violating that second commandment? How about stained glass windows that depict Jesus Christ holding a sheep or a small child or ascending into heaven? Wouldn't that violate that second commandment? Not making images of things that are in heaven? How about pictures or paintings of Jesus Christ hanging on the wall? Would that not violate that? Or crucifixes hung on a wall or worn around your neck? Would that not violate that commandment of God not to make graven images? How about paintings of God's hand and finger reaching out to touch the finger of man like on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Does that not violate that commandment? How about paintings of the Lord's Supper? You see, all of these things are violations of the second commandment of making graven images or likenesses of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or it is in the water under the earth. Wendy and I have a bad habit. We wander into churches. We are probably the only two people on the planet that walk into Catholic churches with a camera and take pictures of this stuff. Most people look at us like we're crazy. It's, it is interesting though, the light, we did this in St. Augustine last week, the, the, one of the interesting things is that we're really quiet though, we like whisper, I don't know if there's something about the place that makes you want to be quiet, but it's amazing the amount of stuff that you find in those places that, just like what I just described, and every one of them, there's nothing wrong with stained glass windows, I love stained glass windows, as long as they don't have pictures in them. You want to take a bunch of different pieces of colored glass and make a window out of it? Fine! Help yourself! But don't put a picture of God in it, or a picture of Christ. By doing so, you just violated the second commandment. Okay? Uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Something that we noticed in that Catholic church. Some of you are former Catholics. You walk down the aisle, you kneel, you cross yourself, and then go take your seat. You kneel before the idol that is directly in front of that aisle that you just walked down. And what does it say? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Direct idolatry. Consider that. That's what Jeroboam started. That's where that came from. Jeroboam is the one that came up with that stuff and has been traveling down ever since. The next king is found in 1 Kings chapter 15 and, 30, and, and verse 26. He didn't live very long. He lived about, he, were, he lived longer. He, he, didn't, he didn't reign very long. He was a king for about two years before, um, before he was murdered by the next guy. His name was Nadab, and in 1 Kings 15, 26, it said, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And he only reigned the two years, and then he was killed by Basha. We read about Basha in 1 Kings 15, 27, the very next verse. And Basha, the son of Ahiah, 
of the house of Ishkar conspired against him and Basha smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. So Basha comes along and kills the other king and takes over. That makes him a murderer. That's important to, important to understand as we go a little bit farther. Um, the, next, the next king was, um, was Elah. First uh, Kings chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. It says, in the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Basha, to reign over Israel in Terzah two years. So he only reigned for two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of the half of his chariots, conspired against him. As he was in Terzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Erza, steward of his house in Terzah. So he was having a little bit too much to drink and ended up being killed off by the next guy that came along as king who is Zimri, and we find him in, in uh, 1 Kings 16 and verse 20, where it says, Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason that he wrought, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? This guy killed himself in the palace of the king's house, and we read about that in 1 Kings 16 and verse 18. Next would be Omri, in 1 Kings 16, 25 through 26. Where it says, but Omri wrought evil in the, size, in the eyes of the Lord, like these other guys didn't. <laughs> Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. But think about all of those that were before him. Jeroboam especially, and then you've got murderers, you've got treasons, or whatever the word would be for those that commit treason. You've got drunks. And, he, and this guy did worse than all of those. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. He, re, he reigned for 12 years. Omri reigned for 12 years. And he's the one that actually moved the capital of Israel to Samaria. He did that in the sixth year of his reign. So the capital was then moved to Samaria and from that point forward that's where the capital of the northern uh, kingdom was. And then we come down to Ahab and this is the one that, that um, Elijah had to face. Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. We'll spend a little bit of time on him. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now think about all of those that came before him. Think about the evil that they had done before him, and he did above that. The most evil man that ever sat on the throne of Israel was Ahab. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, as if that was no big deal that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. It's, now remember, Jeroboam had made these calves to represent the God of heaven. Ahab just gets rid of the God of heaven altogether and goes ahead and calls him Baal. The calves no longer represent Jehovah, they represent Baal. They've always represented Baal. And Ahab's the one that brings that word absolute false, uh, just takes the, takes the hidden part off of it and brings it out for what it actually is. So he, and he took, the, the, took to wife Jezebel. The nation of Israel had been told specifically not to make marriages with from those from the other nations that they had conquered. They were clearly told not to do that, and Ahab does it anyway. Okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 3, it says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, 
and they may, that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And that's exactly what happened. When people, when Christian people, when God's children get involved with, in marriages with those that are not part of God's kingdom, it usually doesn't work well. They will tend to end up following the God of the other people. Because it's more fun. It is. There's a lot more fun in false religion than there is standing here listening to some old overweight bearded dude that pounds on a pulpit every Sunday morning. It's a whole lot more fun. So why wouldn't you? And that's the warning that God gives. And he reared up an altar, this is verse 32, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal which he had built in Samaria. You just go ahead and name it Baal. The first church of Baal. He built a temple in Samaria to compete with the temple in Jerusalem. But the temple in Jerusalem was for Jehovah God. The temple in Samaria was just clearly for Baal. We just write that guy off altogether. That's how they, they had gotten to the point to where God was either dead or never really existed to begin with. The God Jehovah. And they had drifted completely into idolatry. And Ahab made a grove. Now I've pointed this out before. Grove, this word grove comes from Strong's 842. And it refers to a statue, an image of Ashereth made of wood, a wooden pillar. One of these statues with an image drawn in it, that's what these groves were. Um, sometimes you get the idea that it's just a bunch of trees. Well, within that bunch of trees you have these pillars. If you look at, it's a good example, there's that thing in England, Stonehenge. That would be an example of a grove. If you look at, there are pictures of Rome where there are all these colonnades of columns that just, just call, that's, those are groves. And those are idols that people are bowing down to. Um, verse 33, And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So each successive king had been worse than the king before him, and now Ahab was even worse than all the rest of them combined. Under Ahab, open defiance of the Lord God, blatant wickedness had reached their high point in Israel. And remember, he'd done worse than all, of those, than all of those kings before him. Some of those kings were murderers. And he'd done worse than that. In fact, they even went so far under Ahab's reign to try to rebuild Jericho. And Joshua had pronounced a curse on whoever it was that brought that about. And it was under Ahab's reign that they tried to do it. Fell right in with the prophecy. They'd gotten that far. They'd moved that far away from God. Couldn't care less what God had said. And this is the man that Elijah gets to go visit, pay a visit to. And in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, we see Elijah. This is the first mention of Elijah. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, now it doesn't tell us how he got there, we just know that he shows up, because he's talking directly to Ahab. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now we're going to break this down in a few minutes, but I want, to, I want to look a little bit at some of the points about Elijah, and then we're going to actually get into breaking down that verse, and you're going to see some interesting things come out of that. It's important to note that we have virtually no information about Elijah, other than what we find in these few passages and in a couple of texts over in the New Testament. We know that the name Elijah literally means my God Jehovah is he. That's what the word translates. 
Elijah means my God Jehovah is he. The word Tishbite only occurs six times in scripture, always in connection with Elijah, always translated from the same Hebrew word, and it means an inhabitant of Tisha. So I guess he was from, that must have been his hometown. But you can't find it. It's, there's no other mention of it. You, can't, you don't find it on a map. You don't find it in a Bible. This is the only place we find it, and it's always in connection with, with Elijah. That's the only thing we find. We have no idea who he was, where he came from, who his parents were, what his background was, how old he was, where he went to school, where he went to church, or anything else. We don't know anything about him. It's apparent that he was from Gilead, because it says that. Of the, he was of the inhabitants of Gilead. But Gilead had been divided amongst two and a half different tribes. Um, it was divided amongst uh, Reuben and Gad and, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So we don't know what tribe he was from. Um, we don't even, we, we know virtually nothing about this guy. We don't have anything on his background. Most, a lot of the prophets, you at least know who their parents were. You know something about them. We know more about Moses and Samuel and a lot of these guys. And we, we don't know anything about Elijah. He was, not only that, but he was different from most of the other prophets. He never wrote one word of scripture. Not one. He doesn't have any books named after him. He, he, he uh, his ministry was relatively short, as we see, as we're going to see as we go through this study. He wasn't here for all those years, like Moses and Samuel and some of the others were. He was only here for a few short years. Um, but he's considered of the greatest of the prophets. <clears throat> he was the only one to follow Enoch. You remember you read about Enoch? Enoch was the, the man that never died. Elijah never died. Elijah was, was carried into heaven in a, in a whirlwind within a chariot of fire. He never died. One of the few. That's one of the things that proves to us that the doctrine of reincarnation is poo-poo. Because Elijah never died, and yet, you know, they'll try to say that, well, that, that since John the Baptist was the representative of Elijah, therefore he was the reincarnated Elijah. You'll, you'll hear people try to make that point, that that proves reincarnation because Elijah came back as John the Baptist. Elijah never died. So he couldn't have come back as somebody else. He was still there. You know, the guy never died. Um, it was also Elijah along with Moses that stood on the Mount of Transfiguration in glorified form with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given that honor. It was Elijah that the, lo that the Jews looked for, for the forerunner of Christ, which was John the Baptist, as we're told by Christ. It's Elijah that's mentioned over in Revelation when it talks about the two witnesses. It says that, that they have power to shut heaven, that it not rain upon the days of their prophecy. That's clearly Elijah that we're talking about. Elijah representing the prophets in that passage where Moses represented the law the Law and the Prophets, the two witnesses of Christ. And it's Elijah that the Jews to this day still look for. If you go into a Jewish home around Passover, you will find that they will have a seat. They'll have a table. The table will be set. There will be a table set setting there for Elijah, and they will leave the front door open in case he comes by. To this day, they still do that. The story of Elijah proves as much as any other, as we get into this, you'll see it, that God trains a man for the work that he has in mind for that man to do. He doesn't just willy-nilly pick a guy and the guy gets to pick where he goes. That's not how it works. He trains a guy and sends him where he wants him. God knew what kind of condition Israel was in. He knew that it would take somebody like Elijah to get this job done, and he trained him for years before, apparently, before he ever sent him out to do it. So Elijah was the man that stood there before this wicked king and said, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. In other words, until you hear from me again, it's not going to rain. So let's start by breaking this down. Now that we have an idea of the historical setting, 
in which we are in, let's start breaking down this about Elijah and let's see what we can learn about him. 1 Kings 17 verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, there's four things that we're going to look at here, in this, in, just in this one verse. Four things we're going to break down. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, that's one of them. We're going to break that down. Before whom I stand, we're going to see what that means. There shall not be dew nor rain these years. We're going to look at that. But according to my word, those are the four things we're going to look at. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Okay? The Lord God of Israel liveth. That word Lord in your King James Bible, you'll notice that that's all in capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Wherever you see that word, it's translated from the word that we, that we say Jehovah. The Lord, Jehovah. Every time it, 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 you see it in all caps, that's what it's translating. Okay? We're talking about Jehovah, who is the name of the supreme God amongst the Hebrews. This is the same as the I am that I am, that Jehovah. The, in fact, the later Hebrews, for some centuries before the time of Christ, they were either, had either been mis misled by false interpretation of certain laws or by superstitions to getting to the point to where they wouldn't even pronounce the word. Now that's nonsense. There's no reason why you can't pronounce the word, but they came to the conclusion that you couldn't, and so they wouldn't. They won't even pronounce that name. So that's, the, that's who we're talking about. When Elijah stands before Ahab, he is pointing out that it's Jehovah, the Lord. Jehovah, the Lord. The word God comes from the word Elohim, which is, the word Elohim, in this case, it's a plural noun with a singular verb. Now, it, it occurs some 2,300 times, I think it is, in the Old Testament. Um, Sometimes this word is actually translated gods, plural, because it's a plural noun. If it takes a singular verb, it's referring to the true God. If it doesn't take a singular verb, then it's referring to multiple gods. Okay? Um, but the God that we're talking about here, since it is a singular verb that we're dealing with, we're talking about the Lord Jehovah God. Okay? To make no mistake about it, we're talking about Jehovah Elohim. He's the God that created things in the beginning. If you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it talks about Elohim is the one that created everything. So when he stands before Ahab and says that Jehovah, the God that created everything, follow me? Okay, that's who, that's who I'm talking about here. Not this Baal character you got over here. I'm here representing Jehovah the God that created the heavens and the earth. Okay? Jehovah Elohim. Now it's common to see these names put together. It's not, un, not uncommon at all to see this. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 35, we have the same type of language. It says, Unto thee it was shown that thou mightest know that the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, that the Lord, he is God, Elohim. Okay? That there is none else beside him. So that construction is not uncommon at all to have these two names side by side to point out exactly who it is we're talking about. That we're talking about the I am that I am that created heavens and earth. That's who we're that's who Elijah is approaching Ahab with. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 39, it says, Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, that's Jehovah, he is God, Elohim, in heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. You find the same construction in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. And also in Jeremiah verse 10, chapter 10 and verse 10, 
this idea of having Jehovah Elohim I am that I am that created everything so understand that that's who Elijah is announcing before this wicked king who has written this God off written him off for dead and is now serving Baal okay in open defiance of the God that Elijah is representing so the Lord God of Israel of Israel this is the God that chose Israel as a favorite nation it's not just any God but it's the God of Israel Jehovah Elohim the God of is this God of Israel your God the God that made you the king the God that you're gonna have to answer to someday the Lord God of Israel not the Lord God of the Phoenicians the Lord God of Israel I'm standing in Israel talking to the king of Israel your God in other words the one with which you will have to do the one that you will have to answer to the Lord God of Israel liveth you see for years the Jews had just written him off as dead because he hadn't done anything Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11 because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil because God hadn't answered them quickly when they started to transgress people just figured oh, I can get away with this eh, this is no big deal God doesn't always answer quickly he always answers but sometimes he doesn't answer speedily like in this case he hadn't answered in these 57 years you think about it 57 years is quite a while I'm 61 years old it's almost my entire life so if things started getting bad when I was born he still hadn't answered so people tend to think well I got away with that that's what happens with total depravity you find something that you kinda well you know maybe I know I shouldn't do this but I did it and I got away with it God hadn't spanked me maybe I can keep doing it maybe I don't have to worry about it yet and you end up you continue to do it and it continues to get worse and worse and worse and God for reasons of his own for whatever reason he had endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction that we read about in Romans 9 and verse 22 he'd given them plenty of rope given them all kinds of rope so that they could eventually hang themselves and so now that they've written him off for dead because he hasn't punished them this Tishbite shows up and reminds him of who he is and that he's still alive that he's still out there as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8 we read at that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to minister unto him and to bless his name unto this day before whom I stand Elijah is saying I'm a minister of, of this God that I just announced to you that's who I answer to that's who I represent the Lord God of Israel before whom I stand we even find that angels say the same thing in Luke chapter 1 and verse 19 when the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph we read and the angel answering said unto him I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings Elijah was there as the representative of the God of heaven 
to deliver God's message to the nation of Israel to the very man that could do something to fix the problem. You see, Ahab could have torn down the groves. He could have torn down that temple to Baal. He could have repented. But he didn't. But he could have. You know, when you read the story of Jonah, when, uh, when God sent Jonah to Nineveh, Jonah didn't want to go. Because Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were a bloodthirsty people that were going to take over Israel. And he didn't want to go preach to these people. And he preached to them, but he ended up finally, after being swallowed by a whale, he, he got the, the idea that maybe it'd be better to go ahead and preach to them than it would to live inside of a fish. So he went and preached to them, and they repented. The Bible says they repented in, in sackcloth and ashes, and God pulled back and didn't destroy them. Ahab could have done the same thing, but he didn't do it. God sent Elijah to him, and he didn't do it. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. Now, in Israel, they have a wet and a dry season, like we do here in Florida. We had a wet and dry season in Bakersfield, California, and the wet season lasted from November 1st until November 3rd. And the rest of the year was dry. Here, from May until November, is, it seems like it rains almost every, every couple of days at least, and then even though it's raining out there today, it, during the dry season, we don't see quite so much rain. Okay? Same kind of a thing in Israel. They had a season where it was wet, where it would rain, and then they had a season where it was dry. In Deuteronomy 11.14 it says that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. You see, there were different seasons. The first rain and the latter rain. That thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. So there were, there were periods where it was dry and there were periods where it was wet. That was, that was pretty common. Um, Jeremiah chapter 5.24 says Neither, neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, that, that giveth rain both the former and the latter. You see, two, we've got these two seasons. In his season, he reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. So you had a wet season, you had a dry season. Okay, that was normal. Elijah comes along and says that there shall not be dew nor rain these years. Now, I haven't lived here long enough to find out how, what happens if you don't have rain for a long period of time. But I'll, let me give you an, a quick example. Yeah, out in California, where, where Wendy and I lived for so many years, um, most of the lawns in the town we lived in were made out of Bermuda grass. They didn't use the St. Augustine grass that they have here. It would, that stuff wouldn't last out there. They used Bermuda grass, and Bermuda grass is actually a weed. It's really not even grass. It's, it's a, they use it in golf courses for greens in some cases, but it, it grows. You have to mow it down really, really thin, almost like this carpet, and so it works really well for, for a green on a golf course. Um, and if you just get a little sprig of Bermuda grass, eventually it'll take over, every, it'll choke out everything else. And you will end up with a Bermuda lawn. That's just how it works. Now, Bermuda grass goes dormant when it gets cold. So whenever the temperature gets below about 40 degrees, it turns brown. First time you have a frost, turns brown and it'll stay brown again until spring when it starts to turn green again. And during that period of time, you can just shut the sprinklers off. Just turn them off altogether. It won't rain. It just, and it doesn't matter. Next spring, when it starts to turn green, you turn the sprinklers back on. It'll live that long. It'll live for six months without any water at all. It'll be fine. The roots are still okay. So if this drought was only going to last for five or six months, it wouldn't be all that big of a deal, would it? But when we ran into the mortgage meltdown thing and started getting in a bunch of foreclosure homes where they turned the sprinklers off and the sprinklers were off for a couple of years, 
even the Bermuda grass died and you could never bring it back. It was dead as a stone. And they had to dig it up and plant a new lawn. Okay? We're talking about a country that makes, that its fortune is dependent upon agriculture. And Elijah stands before the most wicked queen, king and queen and says, you're not going to have any rain for, for years. That will decimate an agricultural area. That will not only just, not just going to hurt you this year, but that'll kill everything. That'll kill the grape vines. You have any idea how long it takes to get grapes off of a grapevine? You don't just take a grape seed and plant it in the ground and the next year get grapes. It takes decades to have a good grapevine. You don't just plant an olive pit and the next year have olives off of the tree. You got to let the tree grow and then wait for years and years before you get any. One of the fastest growing trees, in fact this was a tax shelter for a long time in California, avocado trees. You've got one in your backyard. They would, they would sell um, syndications into an avocado ranch and it would be a, you would lose money on these things and so you get a tax write off uh, on them for seven, eight, nine years before they'd actually start producing enough fruit to where they make a profit and then they'd sell you out of it and move you into something else. But that would take, it takes years. We would go buy almond groves that they would plant out by where we used to live. You know, these little trees. I'll be dead before they get the first almond off of those things. It doesn't just turn around overnight. It takes years. So if you decimate an agricultural area by killing everything they have, they're not going to turn around as soon as the rain comes. You've got to start all over again. And if you're going to punish them for three years with no rain, you're not going to have any crops left. You're not going to have any seed left to even try to start to get back from this. Okay? And it gets worse, it gets worse than that. Okay? Remember what I said in Ecclesiastes, because sentence against an evil work is not executed, it's not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. When God finally gets around to punishing, it's not fun. It's horrible. Watch what Jeremiah or what uh, what Elijah says here. There shall not be dew nor rain these years. You know, even on a dry morning, even when it hasn't rained, if I walk out and walk across the lawn with my bare feet, my feet get wet. Why? Didn't rain. Cuz of the dew. What happens when you shut off the dew? Now you have no water. Now you have nothing to keep things alive. You see the point? When God gets around to punishing because of idolatry and because his children turn their back on him, it's not a pretty situation. It may be a long time, he's long suffering, but when he finally gets torqued, it's not good. There not, shall not be due nor rain. And I don't, you know, we're going to see as we get into this study, we're going to see these priests try to do what we, we see. Um, I don't know if this was real or not, but always in the cowboy and Indian movies that they had when I was a little kid, you always saw the Indians trying to do a rain dance. You remember, probably heard about them doing a rain dance, trying to get it to rain. Those never work. They never work. Man can't bring about rain. I don't care how much you dance or what you do. It's not going to rain until God says it's going to rain. In Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 22, it says, Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? You really think you can come up with some method to cause rain? You know, if there's no, I, even if you're going to seed the clouds, you've got to have clouds. You can't go up there and seed something that isn't there. We can't cause rain. 
Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles who can cause rain, or can the heavens give showers? Art not, not thou he, O Lord, our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. God can shut the water off. And he did in Israel. And then we have the verse that says, according to my word. In other words, until you hear from me again, we don't know how long it's going to be. He mentioned years. He said something about years here. Right? These years, not these six months, but these years. But according to my word, until I come back. When we read about it in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1, the next chapter says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. In the third year. Now this brings up an interesting point. Keep your finger there and turn over to Luke chapter 4 and verse 25. In Luke chapter 4, 25, Jesus says, But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. Okay? Jesus says three years and six months. First Kings said that he came to him in the third year. Which was it? we have a contradiction in the Bible? God came to him in the, in the third year. Jesus said the rain was shut off for three years and six months. How do you reconcile that? Looks like two different numbers, doesn't it? So was the drought three years? Was it three and a half years? Here's the answer to the question. The drought had already been going for six months before Elijah ever went before Ahab. God had already shut the water off. Notice, Elijah didn't say God's going to stop the rain. He said, there shall be no dew nor rain. The drought was already in effect when Elijah stood before Ahab and told him it's gonna be a while longer. Now I want I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this, man. I, I do not have the fortitude to go before somebody like Ahab and deliver that kind of news to him. I don't have the metal for that. I don't know what kind of man it would take to do that. I don't know if any of us really have the, could, could really, I mean, we might think we could do it, but could you really? Could you really walk up to somebody that wicked and, and get in their face? I don't know that I could. You know, someday I might have to, but so far I don't know that I've got it. But Elijah did. He had the strength to do that. To walk up to the most wicked king, I mean a man that was so far beyond any politician we've got today, and deliver that kind of news to him? And you want to walk up to Obama and tell him your website's not going to work for another three years? You want to be the one to deliver that kind of news? Where did he get that kind of strength? That's what I want to deal with now. Where in the world did Elijah, how was he able to tap into that kind of strength to be able to do something like that? To be able to walk up to this guy and say that. How did he know that he could even walk away from that kind of a meeting? Where did that come from? Turn to James chapter 5 and verse 17. You know, I, I've mentioned before, and, it, and it's true, there, the Jews there for a long time thought that Elijah, since we don't know anything about him, they thought he was an angel. They thought he just dropped out of the sky as an angel, because they didn't have any history. And this verse is going to show us that that wasn't the case, that he was just a guy. He was a man. James chapter 5 and verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly 
that it might not rain, and it rained not upon the earth by the space of three years and six months. You have Elijah in Gilead. Elijah began his prayer. He didn't begin praying after he met Ahab. He started praying long before he went to Ahab, and it wasn't in, until his prayer had been answered that he started traveling to go talk to Ahab. In a little bit, we're going to see why he prayed that way. But he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. You think, well, that's a horrible thing to pray. What a horrible prayer to have. We're going to see why it was the correct prayer in a few minutes. And I want you to look quickly at verse 16, the, the verse just in front of that where it says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then it goes into talk of, to use Elijah as the example of the righteous man whose prayer is effectual and availeth much. I want you to give heed to that descriptive adjective in there, righteous. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not every Christian and certainly not every man gets answers to his prayers the way that Elijah did. You have to be a righteous man. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that you can pray that God will shut the rain off and have it happen. It worked for Elijah because Elijah was a righteous man. What, right, what Elijah cared more about than anything else in the world was the honor of his God. These people had been, had turned their back on God. They had basically spit in God's face and it made Elijah mad. And Elijah found verses in the Bible that said what could happen if that ever happened and he prayed for those verses to come true because people had stepped on the majesty of his God. That's the type of man whose prayers get through. When you put God first and you're more concerned with what God said than your own life, then your prayers get through and they get answered. And then you have the strength to stand before someone like Ahab. Because think about this, you pray to God that it's not going to rain for six months for, for, because of what the people have done and the rain shuts off and here it is the rainy season and there's, no, and there's no rain. The prayer was answered, God heard me. So when God says go do this, okay, yes sir, you do it because your prayer got through. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22, it says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You want your prayers to get through? Then keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Those are the type of people whose prayers get heard. Those are the type of people whose prayers get answered. It's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. And he knew, Elijah knew the power of prayer. And here's the outstanding mark of a righteous man whose prayers prevail, he puts the honor of the Lord before everyone else and before every other consideration. God said in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30, for them that honor me, I will honor. You put God number one, your prayers will get through, just like Elijah's did. Frequently though, we fall into that category that James talks about over in James chapter 4 and verse 3, where he says, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your lusts. You pray for what God wants and your prayer will get answered. You pray for God's will, your prayer will get answered. We ask amiss when natural feelings sway us, when carnal motives move us, when selfish considerations actuate us. But look at Elijah. He was deeply stirred by the horrible indignities against his master, and he longed to see him given his rightful place again. 
And so he prayed that it not rain on the earth. And where did he base that from? How did he come up with this idea of praying that it not rain? Where did God ever say that you should pray that it not rain? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11. This was written by Moses centuries before Elijah was ever born. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 through 17. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good grand, ground which the Lord, God, Lord giveth you. God had already told him, if you do this, I'll stop the rain. Elijah prayed that he shut the, off the rain, and he did it. He answered the prayer. So that's why it wasn't a horrible thing for Elijah to pray for. He prayed for exactly what God told him to pray for. That if the nation turned their back on him, that this was one of the consequences, that it wouldn't rain. And that was one of the places where Elijah was able to get strength. You see some of these characters, that Bible characters, and other people that, have, that appear to have so much strength and so much faith and so, or can, can stand up against the wiles of the devil. Why? Well, they've been exercised to this. They've practiced. They didn't start that way. They've had years of practice. And they've prayed to, about something and had it answered. And they've prayed about something and had it answered. And they live a righteous life and they pray about something and they get it answered. And pretty soon they start to realize, this is real. This guy is real. He actually exists. Okay? That's one of the things that Elijah was able to deal with. There's something else. Elijah knew God's word. As we just saw in Deuteronomy, he knew what God's word said. He understood God's word. He understood God because he understood God's word. In Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32, it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong. You want to be strong? Get to know God. How do you get to know him? Get to know his word. Study his Bible. That's how you get to know him. In Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And you look at Elijah. Do you not think he was bold as a lion to stand before King Ahab and say what he said? I mean, just think of it. Just try to put yourself in that position. Try to put yourself in the position of having to do something like that. And picture what he, what he actually went through. You know, I... I you, there have been stories of, of military officers that were devout men. And you look at some of the things that they went through. Some, some of the unbelievable courageous things that they would do during the course of a battle where most of us would be hiding behind a rock somewhere and they would just stand up and go into battle. And it wouldn't phase them a bit. And then you find out, oh, lo and behold, the guy was a Christian. The guy believed in God. That's what it takes. That's where that strength comes from. It doesn't come from anything else. That's where it comes from. Psalm chapter 3 and verse 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. That was written by King David, and we know that he knew God. God said he was a man after his own heart. He said in Psalm 27, verse 3, Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. Why? Why can these people do that? Because they're aware 
that God is really there. They're aware of his presence. They're aware that he's with them. They're aware that as long as they stay true to what they have been given in his holy word, he will be there with them. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 1 and verse 19, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse. In Psalm 23 verse 4, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. And in Psalm 27 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? You put your trust in God, you follow God's word, you, oh, you be obedient to God's commandments, you have nothing to fear. Who can fight against God? Who is stronger than God? If God has his arms wrapped around you, who can hurt you? And that's the type of man Elijah was. That's why he was able to stand before King Ahab as he was, as, as he did. David said in Psalm 118 and verse 6, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? What can he do? Kill me and send me to heaven? Boy, that'd suck, huh? What a horrible thing to have happened. Isaiah chapter 43, you might want to turn to this one. Isaiah 43 and verse 1. <clears throat> but now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. <clears throat> When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee, since thou was precious in my sight. Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Let's pause for a moment and think about this. Let this sink down into your head. Because this explains the almost more than human courage that's been displayed by so many servants of God in every age. What was it that gave Moses the strength to stand before Pharaoh. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about this guy walking in with a stick in his hand before the most powerful man in the world and point his finger at him? Have you ever considered what kind of intestinal fortitude that takes? What kind of strength that takes? Think about that. Think of Moses walking up and talking to Pharaoh and announcing those plagues against him. What was it that enabled young David to go forth and meet mighty Goliath? Just a little kid with a slingshot. What was it that gave Paul the kind of strength that he had to stand before King Agrippa and argue with him? and demand to go to Caesar and then stand before Caesar. What kind of strength does a man have to have to do that? I'm not even willing to go fight a parking ticket. Can you imagine the type of strength that these men have? Where does that come from? How do you get to be one of those guys talked about in Hebrews chapter 11? How do you get to be one of those? <coughs> This list could go on and on. All you got to do is read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you haven't read that one, get your hands on it and read it. And read about some of these people that even though they're put, they're, they're tied to a, a, a piece of wood and burnt at the stake, they sing psalms until 
They can sing no longer. Where does that come from? And it's the same, the answer is the same in every case. It's a supernatural power that comes, it's the only way that we can really wrestle against things out there. It comes from knowing God. It comes from the things that Elijah did. His knowledge of God, his consciousness of God's divine presence, his prayer life, the answers to his prayer life, it comes by exercising yourself. By taking little steps at a time until you finally take big steps. You don't start off, if, if, if you want to start lifting weight, you don't start lifting 400 pounds. You start small. And you realize that that works and you take another step and you lift a little bit more until you finally build yourself up. It's called exercising. That's how it's done. You test this and it works and so then you test something else and that works and then you test something else. David said in Psalm 62, 7, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. That's what he thought of it. That's where he went when he needed something. We as Christians have to learn to rely on God for everything and not rely on ourselves. Ben Mott used to have a saying that you have to you have to pray as if it all depends on God and work as if it all depends on you. I'm going to add a little bit to that. You do have to pray as if it all depends on God and work as if it all depends on you. But then when you get it you have to thank God for it because he's the one that gave it to you. It wasn't your efforts. Everything we have, we have as a gift of God. Be thankful for everything. Be thankful that you woke up this morning. Be thankful that you get air to breathe. Be thankful that you got water sitting on the table in front of you. Be thankful for everything. It's all a gift. And God can take it away from you just as quick as he gave it to you. And he gives us strength to do these things. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 29. I think we were already in Isaiah 40. Um, Isaiah 40 verse 29 it says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Where did Elijah learn this? Where do you think he learned these lessons? Where did he learn to wait upon the Lord? It wasn't in a seminary or a Bible school, I can tell you that. It was the same place that Moses learned it. Where did Moses learn that? He spent 40 years wandering around in a wilderness on the backside of a mountain, communing with God. That's where he learned it. He was trained by God for the job that God had for him to do by wandering around in a wilderness for 40 years on the backside of a mountain. That's where he learned it. The Apostle Paul was taught in the deserts of Arabia by himself, communing with no one but God, and Elijah obviously learned the lesson in the solitudes of Gilead for no telling how long before he finally went forward to meet Ahab. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, it says, Fear not thou, fear thou not, I'm sorry, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Because of that remarkable courage of Elijah due to his prayer life, due to his knowledge of God's word, due to his knowledge of God's divine presence, he wasn't afraid to stand before this most wicked king of Israel and say, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's where the strength came from. He'd been tested. He'd been tried. He was ready for the job that God had for him and God sent him. I've got one more point I'm going to try to make here before we close up today. It's a long point, so don't, don't start shutting down yet. 
the next verse. We got through verse one. Woohoo! <laughs> First Kings chapter 17, verses two and three. I'm going to make a point here and then we'll continue on this next week because uh, there's more than one point to be made. 1 Kings 17 verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Careth that is before Jordan. No, I want you, a couple of things I want you to notice. It was the word of the Lord that came unto him. Okay. It doesn't say that the will of the Lord came to him. It doesn't say that the mind of God came to him. We hear this all the time, looking for the mind. I want to find the mind of God or the will of God. You want to know the will of God? Learn the word of God. You want to know the mind of God? Get to know the word of God. It's the word of God. In that book we call the Holy Bible, that's how you find the will of God. You obey the Word of God, and you'll find it. God doesn't sit down and have conversations with us these days. If He speaks to you at all, it's by dropping a verse into the top of your head that will answer a question that you need to go forward and to take the next step. But you can't he can't bring that to remembrance to you if you don't have it there to start with. You get to know his word, and that's how he talks, and that's how you learn his will. The word of the God of the Lord came to him. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, in verse 11 through 14. It says, For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Until Elijah did what God told him to do, God didn't give him any more information. That's really important to see. Because that's the way things are in this life. Until you do what God tells you, can you guys in the back hear me? I hope. Until you do what you already know you're supposed to do, don't expect more information. That has, God has never worked that way. He doesn't give us a road map. He doesn't say, I want you to do this, and then when you finish that, I want you to do this, and when you're done with that, I want you to do this. That's not how it works. He will say, do this. And when you do it, then he'll give you something else. It's almost like dealing with a, with a first grader. You don't give them 15 things to do. You give them one. That's what we used to do with the kids. We'd tell them, go do this. And then when they finished it and came back, then we'd give them something else. If you give them too much, I don't know, they just never get anything done. God never seems to give us more than what he wants us to know to teach us that lesson. And once we have learned that lesson, then he gives us more. That's the way it works. Never expect to get more information if you're not going to be obedient to the information that God already gave you. I'm going to prove that with Abraham here in a minute. Okay? That's very, very that's a very important point. Wendy and I have had to learn that lesson the hard way on more occasions than I can than, than I can think things where we try to kick a door down. We finally learned not to kick doors down anymore. It took us a long time when we were, we'd be struggling financially and thinking, well, how in the world are we going to take 10% of what we make and stick in that? We can't put 10% of what we make in that box. We'll starve to death if we do that. And we had years we'd make $250,000 and starve to death because the money always ended up going somewhere until we finally learned that lesson and started putting it in there now you can live on 10000 a year. It's amazing that God will take care of you if you do what you're supposed to do. And if you're not going to do it, then don't expect more information until you learn the lesson he already gave you. That's the way it works. It's in, it, I cannot stress it enough that if God shows you that there's some sin in your life that you need to deal with, deal with it. Because until you do, he's not going to show you anything else. You will stagnate, 
you will get to the point where you hate going to church, you don't want to come around anymore, you're not learning anything, you're not growing, you're not, and it's all because you're not willing to do what God already told you to do, and you know you're supposed to do it. So do it. He sends Elijah to Ahab, tells him what to do. When Elijah does it, he appears to him and tells him something else. That's the way it works. Now I said I would prove this with an example. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. While you're turning there, I'm going to read a verse to you out of Proverbs. It's Proverbs 3, verse 5, that says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, and he shall direct thy paths. You may not be able to figure out how this is going to work. You may not be able to pencil it out. You may not be able to see how in the world i got to do this, but if I do that, I can't see how that's going to, how I can ever make that work. Don't worry about it. If he said, do it, do it. He'll worry about it. He'll take care of it. You just do what you're supposed to do and, and leave the rest to him. Now, let's look at an example. This is one of those guys over there in Hebrews chapter 11, one of the faithful, so I want you to see we all, we're all human, we all screw up. And I don't know if you've ever considered this or not, but this, this may be a good one for you. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. Okay? God goes to Abraham and he tells him, I want you to leave your family behind. I want you to leave the country you're living in, and I want you to go to Canaan. Okay? That's what he tells him. Now look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31. And Terah, that was Abraham's dad, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, that's where they're supposed to go, that's where God told them to go, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. You see a problem? God says leave your family behind and leave the Ur of the Chaldees and go to Canaan. What does he do? He takes his family with him, and he goes to Haran. You say, well, Haran's probably on the way. Yeah, not so much. Not so much. I don't think the camera will show this. Um, I'll pass it around if you... This is Ur of the Chaldees. For those of you, so you can see this. Okay, Ur of the Chaldees is here. Canaan is over here. See how it's almost due west? See that? You see this up here? That's Haran. So God says, leave your family behind and go over here. He takes his family with him and goes up here. That ain't all that obedient, is it? He did part of it. He left. He left Ur. But Ur of the Chaldees is in modern-day Iraq. And the land of Canaan, where he was sent, is, in, is near Jerusalem, and he went to modern-day Turkey. Not even, on the, not even a direct route. Not even like well, I, we were just on our way and we took a break. And they, sp they stayed in Haran for some time. Okay? So Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran's wife. They were supposed to go to Canaan. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. And then we read in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4. It says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Now it's just Abraham and Lot and Abraham's wife. 
And Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of here. And I don't know how old he was when he left Ur of the Chaldees. But he's 75 now. And Abram took Sarah his wife and, and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered. They'd been there for a little while in order to gather some substance. This wasn't just an overnight stay. That they had get, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, they had a bunch of babies while they were there. They weren't just there for a week. It takes longer than that to have souls, plural. You see my point? He'd been there in Haran for, for a number of years. One of the reasons it took so long for Abraham to finally have that promised child is because Abraham kept getting in the way. It, it wasn't until he was obedient that God started to answer him. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came, which is where they were sent to begin with. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem, into the plain of Moriah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there he built it an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. God appears to Abraham and tells him, Leave your family, go to Canaan. He never appeared unto him again until Abraham finally appeared in Canaan, which is where God sent him to go. Same with Elijah. God sent Elijah to go talk to King Ahab, after he did so, God gave him more instruction. That's the way it works. You want to know what God wants you to do? Then do what he's already told you to do. And once you've done that, then you can expect more. That's how it works. That's how he teaches us. And sometimes it takes years to finally get enough faith to do what he told you to do. I'm a witness of that. I know I'm not 15 years old. I'm not some superstar like Ben Mott. I mean, look at me. I'm an old man. It took me a long time to learn some of these lessons. And so all I'm trying to do is pass on to you what I've learned so it doesn't take you as long as it did me to learn. It's kind of like I tell my kids. I can tell you, don't step in that hole over there. I told you guys that when, when you first called me. I may not be able to give you all the best advice in the world, but I can tell you what not to do. Because I've done what you're not supposed to do and stepped in the hole. I can point out where the holes are. But if you decide you want to step in them, well, I can't help you after that. God only typically gives us one lesson to learn at a time. That keeps us totally dependent on him. And once Abraham finally did what he was supposed to do, then God gave him more instruction. You see, the way we learn these things, if you turn over to Hebrews chapter 5, you'll see the Apostle Paul deals with this, and we're, we're coming to a close. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's by using it. It's by exercising. It's by testing the waters, if you will. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I actually preached on this one time a long time ago here in, in Lakeland. 2 Peter 1.5, it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. God gives you a little bit of faith. And so you take that faith and you add to, the, add to that, you add virtue. We're not gonna, I'm not going to do the whole sermon, but you, you, take, you figure out what virtue is and you add to that. You, all you got to begin with is a little bit of faith. So you add virtue to that. And then after you've got, you're working on that, you add to virtue knowledge. See, you've got to be, you have to have the virtue in order to get the knowledge. You have to do good in order to get the knowledge. It's a, the, 
The righteousness has to come along. You got a little faith, so then you start cleaning up your act, and with that you gain knowledge. You start to learn a bit, little bit more. And to knowledge you add temperance. You become more and more moderate in the in the way you do things. And to temperance you add patience. You can't you don't get patience right off the bat. That's not number one. You've got to get all this other stuff before you get to the point of being patient. And to patience, you add godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And you work your way up the ladder. You add a little more and a little more by trial and error, by testing, by doing what God tells you to do. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, you know what abound is? Abound means that if I... If I take this water bottle and I start pouring water into it until it's spilling all over this page down here, it's abounding with water. If it abounds, it's overflowing. If these things be in you and they abound, they overflow, then they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's a contrast. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If you don't work on it, that's where you go. If you let it slip, that's where you go. God can give you as much as you can handle. But if you stop and stagnate, you'll lose everything you had. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. So with that, we will close for this morning. We're pushing right up against the noon hour. Um, next week, we'll come back and we'll continue this study on Elijah. We'll finish up with what we're looking at with, 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 uh, with him being sent to this brook. Uh, we'll see how he was fed. We'll see the provisions that God made for him. We'll see that once again, God leaves him there for a long period of time before he ever appears to him again. And to test his faith, to see how faithful he is before he finally comes to, again, to him again and gives him more instruction. And you'll, you'll see that very plainly in the, in, the next, in the next lesson. So until then, I thank you for your kind and patient attention. And let's please stand and be dismissed.